Tonight, Molly Kelly joins the teams to discuss chastity and the rising rate of teen pregnancy on Up Our Alley. Professional football players Pete Metzelars and Steve Tasker of the Buffalo Bills share their game plan for a loving family life, next on Catholic Magazine. With your window on your world, this is Catholic Magazine. Good evening, everyone. I'm Paul Pirello. Good evening. I'm Pat Sheldon. Thank you for joining us again this week. On our program tonight, we travel up our alley to hear what our teens have to say about teenage pregnancy. And a little later in the program, we'll have a football feature, especially for those of you who are still going through football withdrawal. But first on our program tonight, we do travel up our alley and we hear firsthand from our teens about what they think about teenage pregnancy and about ways that might be able to be prevented and the whole issue of teenage sexuality in general. One million teenage girls become pregnant every year. That's 25% of all sexually active girls. Alarmingly, that number continues to increase. Teenage pregnancy is our topic tonight, Up Our Alley. Up Our Alley is a forum which gives Catholic youth from the Delaware Valley an opportunity for expression and education through discussion. Now let's join Sue and her friends in the alley. Good evening and thanks for joining us once again, Up Our Alley. Tonight my guests are, we have Molly Kelly, a national, nationally known lecturer on chastity. On my left I have Lynn Cathcart and Donna Cassidy from the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. We also have from the Diocese of Camden, Jackie Lug and Matt Mernan. And on our fire escape from the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, Kathy Malone and Brian Whalen. Okay, we're going to start right off tonight with this topic. Um, why do you guys think so many teenage pregnancies are happening? Um, probably because uh, uh, people aren't willing to uh, take the responsibility to think things through and uh, it's just sort of kind of like a thing that happens, you know, people don't uh, I guess they don't think things through enough, I would say. Also cause beca because uh, maybe some people aren't educated properly and they don't know the right precautions to take. No sexual education. Right. Exactly. I also think um, abortion has a lot to do with it. They know that there's a way out if something happens. Okay. Well, what do you mean by precautions, Brian? What, what, would you, what do you think? Well, some people don't know anything about birth control and what methods to use and but things like is that, that to avoid. Do you think that's the answer? Do you think that would solve teen pregnancy? Uh, abstinence, I'd probably say, would be the best. <laughs> but um, even if they, do, if they do decide to have sex, they should know what precautions to take. Okay, but as Catholics? As Premarital Catholics, sexes. abstinence. Abstinence. Well, abstinence. As, as people who really want to know the truth, I mean, whether we're Catholics or whatever we are, contraception fails. We know it fails. Birth control pill, 500 women die every year. In other words, you know, I think we'd all have to be honest, and if we truly care about teens, which is what I see, you people really care about each other, uh, I think the bottom line is nobody has to take medicine in order to control their sexuality. So uh, your generation is capable of abstinence. I think it's my generation that doesn't sometimes think you are. Good point. <laughs> um, do you think teens consider the consequences? You alluded to this. Someone did. You know, they don't consider the consequences before they have sex. It's just the heat of the moment and then... Yeah, I think a lot of people um, today think that it won't happen to them. You know, they know a friend or they've heard about it and they know the statistics, but they don't think it'll happen to them and they don't bother worrying about it. And I agree with that. I think a lot of people think they're invincible. You know, you see it happen to other people or you hear about mm -hmm. it. And, you know, but, oh, I know what to do, or I know that won't happen to me. And then I think, or I know personally, like, I know a lot of people lately, people who I haven't been in high school with since mm -hmm. freshman year, and now it's like, oh, my God, she's pregnant, you know? And so it, it really hits home, and then that makes you think. Okay, how well do you think schools handle the problem of teen pregnancy? Well, I know um, in my school... Don't mention kind of, your schools. I know. Um, it's, not, it's kind of hush-hush at first. Like the administration wouldn't talk about it or anything, but um, student-wise, um, I don't think there's really a lot of gossip about it. But it, it, someone disappears for a little while and they come back, and it's not really talked about. Is that true of, of the other schools? Yeah, I would also? say that. Um, you know, that's it's, it's like she said. People, you know, disappear or whatever. And but, um, like, they've come to the school and they try and do what they can for the person. 
but I won't say I wouldn't say they go out of their way for the person. And then you know, it's just I mean it, people aren't they're not teased or anything else like that. They're just um, I guess it's it's just the way they're treated. I don't think they're treated any differently. You know mm -hmm. while they're pregnant. Mm -hmm. so. Are the girls allowed to go to school pregnant? Aren't they allowed? Yeah, just up to a certain yeah point? up until you know they they themselves you know don't want to come to school as far as I've seen. How's the guy treated? In other words, the girl's pregnant, we know pregnancy, and, uh, and, and she can be seen. How, how's the guy treated by others, or is the guy known, or is, are there uh, any reactions as far as the fellow with the, involved with the pregnancy? Well, um, I've, seen, um, I've seen it happen a while ago, and the guy wasn't, it was treated, you know, just like he was, you know, normal. There was, mm -hmm. like, nothing else. He wasn't ridiculed or anything else like that. But, um... You know, I would say, you know, he probably did take a little bit of harassment. The guys would take a little bit of harassment, like, oh, you know, look at how stupid you were. In my school, it's treated like an occasion, like, um, like just like a birthday, you get balloons and flowers, and, you know, I hope it's a girl and stuff like that. It's... Mm. I think the kids mean well by that, because yeah. I, I, I think that you, from what I see, and certainly you're the teens and I'm not, but working with teens constantly, I, th I see you as a sensitive generation, caring. Uh, I, I would see sometimes that's the school's problem, where that's kind of out of line to have showers for kids on on, on campuses uh, pregnant. We don't want them to wear an A. We don't want them to, you know, the scarlet letter and whatnot. On the other hand, uh, if we truly believe that sexual intercourse belongs in marriage, which is really what we're supposed to believe, because that is what God said, then somehow we, we've got to reach out. I guess I brought the boy up because I think that if we're going to counsel the girl. I think we should counsel mm -hmm. the boy too. I don't think it should always be right. the girl. Not because I'm against the boy, I have six sons, because I think that teen pregnancy is a joint thing. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's impossible. One right. can't do mm -hmm. it without the other. So I think the boy needs the uh, involvement, the counseling, and I do think he cares. Do, do the boys seem to stick with the girls when the situation occurs? Um, it's right. a guy's, it's a guy's, uh, like, you know, he's th it's thought of that, like, if you do that, that the guy's like, you know, he's good and he's, you know, a good mm -hmm. person. But I've seen guys got girls pregnant and they just have want nothing to do with them. Yeah. And those guys are get the reputation of, you know, being whatever and they just don't want to be associated, people don't want to be associated with them mm -hmm. in the most cases. But I think that the public eye is on the girl though most of the time. And so the guy can kind of slip away with no opinion at all on him. Sure, the because girl's it's more obvious around. on a girl than right. it is on a guy. She has to walk around looking that way. It's obvious, you know. Yeah. But, I mean, whatever stand the guy takes, it, he does, he's not subject to the opinion. I was at a school once where I, was, I traveled around the country. The girl was asked to leave school. She was pregnant, and that was that. She had to leave, and the boy was not and the students were beside themselves. In other words, that they didn't see that fair, that he was right. going to graduate and she wasn't. And they came to me as, a, you know, what should we do? All I could suggest was that they, they go to the faculty and they go as students and present and say, hey, this really isn't fair. We don't want him to get it too. We want both of them to remain in school and help both of us type thing. But I think young people have more power sometimes than they think they right. have as far as influence in school policy. Well, because uh, I know the, the one girl who uh, my freshman year in high school uh, got pregnant, and she ha had had enough credits where she could graduate early, so they did let her. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, allow allow her to do that. Mm -hmm. But well, you travel around lots of different high schools. How well do high schools handle this when it occurs? Uh, it's it's really on a pretty much individual basis. Uh, as far as Catholic dioceses, they they attempt to have a policy where all the schools are doing the same thing. I think it's important. Um, for uh, parents to be involved as far as what's happening so that the schools and the parents and the families and the young people are all working together. But uh, I guess it's never uh, handled completely well. Uh, we can always do more, but I think schools are trying. I think the kid, we, there has to be communication. Lots of times the kids know the girl's pregnant, but the school doesn't know the girl's right. pregnant. So you, you can't help someone that you don't know is pregnant. Right, hypothetical situation because being Catholics, premarital sex is, is against what the church believes. Do you think the condoms should be handed out in schools? Um, well, I guess we get a lot of guidance from our parents and, and such like that. And like they've always said, you know, you know, they don't think so. And I don't think so either because, you know, unless you're, you know, because it shouldn't be the, it shouldn't be it's the an encouragement. It should, yeah, well, it should, yeah, it sort of is in a way. But it shouldn't be the high school's responsibility to do that, you know. And, um, you know, it's like, 
if you if you're gonna take retake uh, take the responsibility, you know, you should be able to go to a store and mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. not be embarrassed to mm -hmm. go buy them yourself. So I think it's become um, an accepted thing today that if they are gonna have it, they even though parents might not like it or adults might not like it, at least they know that they're taking the responsibility of um, protecting themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you think kids really think about, uh, say, the failure rate? In other words, as far as uh, using condoms to control our sexuality, uh, then it's not really a gift if we have to use things. But again, just getting to the whole point, do you think kids think of the uh, failure rate, uh, 10 to 17 percent failure rate? You know, what if they were given the, uh, the safety course in your school on driving and they mm -hmm. said, okay, now take this car, but this, the wheel locks 17 percent of the time? Would, would anybody get in the car and drive that car if the wheel locked 17 percent of the time? You know, it's an absolute given mm -hmm. that, the, that the statistic is correct, that the condom can fail 10 to 17 percent of the time. Do, do young people today really uh, understand how deadly AIDS is? Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's so awesome uh, to be talking about such a deadly disease in so many. Do, they, do, do young people together outside of school talk about AIDS? Um, to, from my experiences, it, if it was, it's been like, it's sort of the word I think of is drilled, drilled into us. Like, mm -hmm. you know, this is the consequences, this is what happens to you. Um, it, I mean, it's talked about, you know, out of school, but not, you know, very much. You know, it's just, uh, you know, w once in a blue moon kind of thing that mm -hmm. you talk about. You know, if someone has questions and, you know, you can go to your friends and say, well, you know, what do you think about this or anything else mm -hmm. like that. And most of the questions, um, go to the health teachers because in our school because they're very mm -hmm. you know knowledgeable on the subjects if I said the C word in other words what's the C word in today's society what, what would you say it was condom <laughs> I know <laughs> knowing you I would say chastity hey good deal <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was gonna say I think that one's talked words, about a lot more yeah. though oh, yeah, oh it is I think that. in other words the C word is condom not as far as what we right. believe but mm -hmm. that's what we hear mm -hmm. and yet uh, it should be commitment in other words, the, right. there's no commitment right. with a condom. If it fails, it's not your fault. It's its fault. Right. So, you know, I'm doing my best to get chastity out only because I believe in the young people. Uh, and, you know, I'm, we are reaching a whole lot of, lot of young people. But what's your belief in? Can young people practice chastity? Mm -hmm. In other words, that's saved sex. Putting it in marriage, and if they've already done it, inviting them to stop. I, mm -hmm. Is that a possibility? I, yeah. think, oh, I, I think it is because um, they're, they're trying to show that they're adult enough, and if they want to be seen as adults, then they can show that they can control themselves. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know. Well, um, I have a boyfriend that we've been going out for over 10 months, and right away I said, you know, I was, I'd gone to Catholic, you know, grade school in City, and it was kind of like we were brought up to, you know, never even think about it. And it wasn't until high school that I actually found out that people were actually doing it that were my age, and it was like a shock, you know. And, um, but we've talked about it a lot of times and we've totally agreed that it's, it's for, at least for us, what we want to do is wait till we get married, which is going to be like 10 years down the road. We know it, we know, but, um, I, I mean, I don't think like, I, the way I figure it is sex is something or making love or whatever is, uh, something that if it's good enough, you can wait until you're married. And I wouldn't want my first time to be something having to worry about if I'm going to get pregnant, what's going to happen, if I get AIDS or whatever. I'd rather have, you know, be married and not having to worry about that. Mm, you could travel with me. We can make <laughs> <laughs> How about the emotional consequences, too? I mean, we can all sit here and talk about pregnancy and sexually right. transmitted diseases, but the tremendous emotional consequences of sex, I, you, I mean, frustration, fear, loneliness, anger, rejection, there's got to be a lot of things that the condom can never fix. Right. And I think you said the most important word today, talk, communicate. You and your boyfriend talk. Mm -hmm. That's the answer. I mean, lots of young people jump in bed and don't talk. In other mm -hmm. words, because love and sex are mixed up. If they do it in the theater, they must do it everywhere else. In other words, if that's what the movie stars do. So I think right. you said the big word, talk. <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, it's come into where uh, the question was asked or told to us. If you're going to be responsible enough to uh, make the decision to have sex, um, you, you should be able to make the decision to say, well, you know, when you have sex, you should be ready to have that baby, care for that baby, be an adult. And it's, uh, I would say it's really hard to uh, grow up like that and, you know, one day find out, you know, you're just a regular teen and next day you have to become an adult because mm -hmm. you have this baby on the way. Good point, because so. you're not. You're not an adult. That doesn't make you an right. adult. Doing an adult right. thing doesn't make you an adult. So I think it's, you know, it's difficult. Yeah. And in in my day, long ago, and I don't want to go back to those days. I like today. I like you kids. 
But in uh, we just simply didn't have a whole lot of teen pregnancy. But I'm going to tell you, you're better. Right, because it's it's but like but we have, didn't do it. We really didn't do it. It's like a, you have to act like an adult, you yeah. know, before you're treated like an adult. But I think the messages are different today. I think you're inundated with sexual messages. I mean, do you think the movies and songs, you know, that adults will tell you they affect you? Do you think they affect you? I don't think they they really do. It's like, it's like with uh, music. They're like trying to say that you know music is so af affected on you. And I think as long as your morals are there and yeah. things like that, as long as you have the, you know, the basis and that's the way you're brought up. You know, you, you yeah. know, you're pretty much not going to change unless there's something majorly but wrong. But desensitization, yeah. if you sat and watched a heavy sexual scene on camera, wouldn't that affect you? I don't. I'd be <laughs> disgusted. <laughs> I, that's You'd be disgusted? Thing. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, I mean, we shouldn't watch other people. I agree. Yeah, that's the thing. I, you, why would you want to watch other people? Right, exactly. You know? it's just I hate to break this up because this is really going well. <laughs> because, um, but unfortunately, we are out of time. Molly, if you could just wrap us up in about 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Oh, a, B, C. A, I want to affirm you in your goodness. B, believe in yourselves. You're a good generation. C, chastity is the answer. Communicate. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, there are many ways to prevent pregnancy, but the best, safest, and 100% most effective way is abstinence. I want to thank all my guests for being with us in the alley. I want to thank Molly for also joining us. We'll see you next time up our alley. Real good, Sue. I was itching to get into that discussion. I'd like to share my opinions on that topic. But anyway, that's ne neither here nor there. We want you to stay tuned following these important messages for more of Catholic Magazine and Little Football. SEP materials for Catholic Magazine provided by Tate Lumber Incorporated, serving the Delaware Valley for over 75 years and by John Wanamaker, fine stores in the Delaware Valley. Life is precious, except unborn life for those who support abortion. Life is holy, except life stricken by disease for those who support euthanasia. Life is hard, especially for the homeless, the hungry, the migrant, the lonely, the condemned. The Catholic Standard and Times reflects all aspects of life in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia and around the world. To bring a Catholic perspective on life into your home 50 weeks a year, call 587-3667 during business hours to subscribe. Mrs. Washburn, I'm uh, Gerald Fry's mother. Oh, don't you work nights? I treated shifts. Mrs. Washburn, about Gerald, I wish I could help him learn better, but I'm no genius. Well, you don't have to do the homework, but ask to see it. Let him show off what he learned. Praise him more. Show you care. You think we got a chance here? A good chance. Show me a parent who really cares, and I'll show you a kid who can learn. The act of praying is also meant to open us up to God and our neighbor, not only in words, but also in action. You're going to be better than me, Christopher. I can see it in your eyes. No wasting your life on something you hate. Not for my son. You're going to college. I can see it in your eyes. I can see it in your eyes. You are going to do something important. Christopher, time for work. We've always had the dreams. Now we have the means. Please, support the United Negro College Fund. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and donations and encourage you to write us at Catholic Magazine, St. Charles Seminary, 1000 East Wynwood Road, Overbrook, PA, 19096, or call us during regular business hours at 668-9842. Welcome back to our program. Many of us have heard the old saying, God is my co-pilot. Well, in our next piece, more than a month after Super Bowl Sunday, for those of you that are suffering from football withdrawal, we find, about, we find out about two Buffalo Bills players who say God is their quarterback as we check in on them both on and off the field. You know, something that being a uh, professional football player has really allowed us the opportunity is, is to spend a uh, quantity of time with the kids. Mm -hmm. 
Well, she's very good about uh, realizing how important football has to be at the professional level to me. Well, I, you know, I think uh, my career, no question, is secondary. For professional athletes, balancing a career and family is not always easy. Buffalo Bills' Pete Metzelars and Steve Tasker find the rewards of raising a family and their accomplishments on the football field are both worth the effort. It's, it's the, one of the most fun things for me is coming home, and no matter how work goes or how the game goes, I come home and, and to have her and the kids uh, come up to me and uh, have the kids run to me and give me hugs and kisses, no matter how how sorry of a game I played on Sunday, uh, to have them still love me and have them waiting for me and to know that uh, I have a refuge and a haven here at home, that, that's, that keeps me going on the football field as much as anything. Around here I tease him that he's, he's not number 89 in our house, he's just Steve, the guy that I went to high school with and the one that, that we, end, we ended up together, the one that, that God gave me, so um, no special privileges at home at all and he's, he's, he helps as if um, he had all the energy in the world when he comes home. I think the kids are the most important thing and, and having the family time and spending time with the family and uh, you know football's going to be over sometime but the family's always going to be here so we want to you know keep that going and, and really put the effort in and, and spend the time with the kids and, and have some fun with them. I think there was a point early in his career where we sort of, it was sort of unspoken, but he just decided that what was there and what happened there didn't come home with him when he left the stadium. I think Pete just made an unconscious or conscious decision that when he was with us, um, it was going to be, what's up with you guys and how are you, and really meaning it, not just absent um, emotionally or, or physically even. During the season, the wives of these athletes must take on much of the responsibilities and needs of the family. I've had conversations with friends whose husbands work what they call normal hours. And I think that Steve may be gone pretty similar number of hours, but they're very different hours. We have to be really flexible in terms of our family. I mean, he, he's not there to go through our bedtime routine, for example. Two nights I do that by myself. and. I often think how thankful I am that I'm not a single parent because I do practice about two days a week being a single parent and it's not fun. The difficult part for me I think is maintaining a normal family life in the midst of all the, the, um, the hoopla and such. I think comparatively with the other 27 cities where there's NFL teams, Buffalo is one of the smaller cities and um, I think it's sort of like living in a fishbowl sometimes. It is really hard on her um, because six months out of the year it seems like you know football does take a, a great priority uh, and it, take, it takes a lot of time um, and um, she has to kind of almost be the leader of the family during those six months handling everything taking care of things around the house. And, uh, At the heart of the Tasker and Metzlar's families are the children and the time they spend together is important. Yeah I think it's such a myth that's been uh, portrayed that uh, you know quality time is what's important you know I think quality time comes from quantity uh, especially with kids because uh, you know you hang out with them for a couple hours and then you know in that two hours or whatever you get little quick uh, glimpses for you know three four five minutes at a time where they really ask important questions that you're there to answer for them and um, I think that's what we've really been trying to do is spend the quantity of time with the kids and, and through that uh, you're going to get the quality out of it. There's no substitute for raising kids when you, when you just then spending time with them and listening to what they have to say and letting them know that, that they have what they say and what they do has value to you and has value to the world around them. And Sarah and I are, try to be very open in our affection for each other because I think that gives the kids a sense of security when they know that their parents love each other. And uh, uh, everything stems from the fact that uh, uh, we pray together as a family, we do a lot of things together as a family, we let them know that no matter what happens, they're accepted in our family and they have a place in our hearts and we love them no matter what. And uh, they seem to be growing up very happy because of that. For these two athletes, raising children and maintaining a close family is the result of their strong faith in God. 
I mean, from the very beginning, we, I mean, we try to instill Jesus Christ in their lives, and um, we work, um, I mean, daily, talk about it, we pray always, we read a lot to them about that, and we go to church, I mean, that's the, the number one thing for us. I think that it's one thing to tell children that that's what you believe, and our children know that we love Jesus and that he's one of the most important people in our lives, including them. But I think it's quite another to every day show that love in some way so that the children see that it's not just lip service because I think they're so perceptive. Uh, serving the Lord does come first, and I think he wants uh, me to, one, be, be the father that I should be to the boys and be the husband I should be to Barb. And then secondly, he's given me the abilities and talents I have to play football. And he wants me to make the most out of those abilities and talents that I have uh, because he's given them to me. And, and, and by doing that, I'll honor and glorify him. Success on the football field never guarantees success at home. For the Metzelars and Taskers, building a loving family will always come first. I think we both have grown together, our life together was existent before football came into the picture and I'm sure will go on much longer after football's out of the picture and so for me my perspective on it is football doesn't have anything to do with who we are as human beings it's a very small part of it and um, I'd like it to stay that way. We'd like to remind you that if you happen to see a container for Operation Rice Bowl in your parish please be generous by donating whatever you can to help give hope to a world in need. Of all the money collected, 25% of the donations remains right here in your diocese to help feed the hungry. And the rest is used by Catholic Relief Services to support programs overseas. St. John Newman Catholic Church, located at 234 Sicklerville Road in Sicklerville, New Jersey, will be holding a mission on March 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th at 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. The mission will be conducted by the Franciscan Friars Ministry of the Word and will be assisted by the parish pastor and deacons. The mission is open to all denominations and those with no church affiliation. For more information, please call area code 609-629-4257. That wraps up this edition of Catholic Magazine. I'm Paul Pirello. And I'm Pat Shelton. We look for you next week on Catholic Magazine. Good night. Good night. It's been said that this is God's country. Never more than from August 11th through the 15th. World Youth Day, an international celebration of faith and love.